Hey, I'm Dave. Welcome to my shop. Today, we're going to do something gloriously anachronistic. We're going to boot Unix on a real deal PDP 1173, the classic 16 bit mini computer, from a period correct and honkingly great DEC RA82 disk drive. If you've only ever known the polite whispers of an SSD or a modern SATA drive, then you're in for a treat. This is spinning rust the size of a large microwave with 14 inch platters, a 3600 RPM belt drive, and servo motors that announce themselves like a 737 spooling up. You can feel it through the floor when it seeks hard. Now this project had been haunting the back of my bench for months. I've been running the 1173 off of a unibone and when I wanted to be lazy, a later year full height DEC RA73. I even installed a SCSI controller and got the PDP booting from both real and emulated SCSI drives, including a jazz disc. All fine, all nice and quiet, but none of them were satisfying. What I really wanted was period correct storage with its own beautiful set of limitations, rituals and noises. Enter a Keyways Rescued RA82, DEX Big Iron for the Vax PDP era, capable of a then ludicrous 622 megabytes whizzing along at 3600 RPM with an average rotational latency in the 8.3 millisecond range. That's not a typo, the spec reads like a love letter to the law of physics, and the first time I spun it up I admit that I stood a fair distance away from it. If one of those big platters actually came apart at those speeds, I imagined it would be rather explosive. But first there was the small matter of getting the nearly 200 pounds of drive from the floor onto the rack or into the rack without recreating a scene from America's Funniest Home Videos. I planned ahead and I ordered a hydraulic scissor lift from Amazon and I like it enough that I put a link in the video description. They're cheap, so treat yourself if you've got to lift anything in your shop like that. My son and I rolled the lift over, lined up the rails and slid the R82 in on its factory sled. You don't so much install one of these as you do berth it like an ocean liner. The only time we actually had to lift its full weight was to get it up onto the lift table and at close to 200 pounds, it's an adventure for those of us with screws and rods in our back, but we got it loaded onto that cart. Deck designed the RA82 with a kind of industrial elegance. A front panel with exactly the switches you need and no more. On the operator control panel, you get a run stop, a fault, and a ready light and right protect and then two port select buttons, A and B, for dual port configurations. And the ready lamp isn't just blinking lights cosplay, it actually tells you when the drive is on cylinder and capable of handling host requests, while the run lamp reflects the actual spindle state. Push run and the servo wakes, the heads float and the thing roars up to speed. Run being lit means the disc is spinning, ready means it's on cylinder, and fault means that you have some figuring out to do. And that numbered ready lens? It doubles as a unit address plug. You actually set the drive number by trimming tiny binary tabs off the back of the cap and then plug it back in to present that code to the cam coded switch behind the lens. It's like old school dip switch energy with a deck flourish. And that ready indicator comes on only after a fault free spin up. It even blinks if you've deselected both ports and the drive is then running internal diagnostics, which I did by accident and then gladly took credit for discovering. The ready light will briefly wink off when serving an actual request, so it's the closest analog to a classic hard disk activity light that you're going to find. The RA82 is proudly self-aware. Inside, there are two microprocessors, a master and a servant, and they divide responsibilities. The servant CPU deals with all the mechanicals, like head loading, servo positioning, spindle control. And then the master CPU manages the overall drive state and the SDI communication with the host controller. Together, they orchestrate startup, run periodic self-tests, and keep the unit honest. If something shakes loose, you can find out which subsystem actually coughed. Spindle interlocks, servo errors, hybrid faults, the works, all via the front panel blink patterns and the internal hex codes. It's a very deck blend of microcode and machinery. Now, an RA82 is not SCSI, and it's not DSSI even. It speaks SDI, DEX Standard Disk Interconnect. Electrically, it's a point-to-point -point differential link terminated at each drive, and the cabling is eight wires of coaxial weirdness. You can't just make yourself a cable without some skill, special tools, and special wiring. Logically, it becomes a home for MSCP block requests once you add the right controller. In my 1173, it's going to be the KDA50 class MSCP to SDI interface card sitting on the Qbus. And your exact choice depends on whether you're a Qbus or Unibus, but the SDI side is all the same. The RA82 supports dual port operation. Two controllers can be cabled, one to port A and one to port B, and the drive can be statically arbitrated between them. DEC even diagrams it out for you, complete with a reminder that it's static dual porting and that your software has to cooperate to make it all just work. The front panel AB buttons merely enable the port. The controller actually has to take the drive online. 
Each R82 ships with a default 12-foot SDI cable for the external run to the I.O. bulkhead. Thankfully, Mitch included all the cables I would need, including the bulkhead piece. If I were dual porting, I'd need one more second cable, but I'm not. Deck offered everything from 6-foot to 80-foot cables. I wound up with about 15 feet of collected cable and only needed about three, so I used only the drive cable and the bulkhead cable and connected the controller cable directly to that. But since the cables swap, transmit, and receive along each wire, you need the right combination for it to work. Because my cabinet also houses other hungry loads, I installed the sequence cable, which is DEC's serial daisy chain that guarantees only one RA80 series drive spins up at a time. Without it, a post-outage, everybody dance now moment could present as a simultaneous inrush that trips the upstream breaker and turns your weekend into solder fumes. Dex caution box is emphatic. Install sequence cables or risk data corruption after power failures. And so, I did as I was told, even though I only have the one drive. With the power, port enables, and SDI all dressed, it was time for the Wilhelm scream. The first run press. Now, the spec says 50 seconds to ready and 20 seconds to stop, but in practice, it feels like about a minute of drum roll, the pitch rising as the spindle locks up at 3600 RPM. And when the ready light comes on, the platter sound drops into a steady turbine whine. I've had the thermal breaker trip on startup a few times, so I'm keeping an eye on it, but so far it's been nothing that a three minute cool down didn't solve. Deck did a lot of work for you in the drive itself so that you don't have to. Each track has a fixed number of sectors, and each sector is wrapped in a tidy header, error detection and correction, and one sector per track is earmarked as a spare. So if a sector actually goes bad, the controller remaps it using a replacement block number and logs that mapping in the RCT, the replacement control table, on the reserved area of the media. The RA82's dual microprocessors do most of this themselves. Your job is to command a format and then present the drive when done to the operating system as a block device and get on with your life. If it's been a while since you worked with even a vintage PC hard drive, there are three steps that you need to undertake. First, you need to do a low-level format. And this is the process that actually goes through the entire drive and prepares the raw sectors to handle future data. You don't do this ever on a SATA drive. It's already done for you at the factory, and that's pretty much the only way to do it. Next, you need to create the partition table, which uses sector offsets to define regions of the disk that will become independent volumes. And finally, you have to create file systems on those partitions and then copy your data to them. To do the low-level format, I use the ZUDK toolset to run the standalone diagnostics from a SCSI disk image and invoke the formatter for unit 0. It walked the surface, calibrated the heads, built the bad block map, and initialized the RCT. There's a sort of tactile serenity to watching a drive do it all. You know down deep that there are real analog realities at play here. Flux reversals, partial responses, and an ECC engine working its butt off, but the interface that you see is all just logical block numbers scrolling by as the RBN list gets populated. In the end, the interface is about as neat and tidy as a modern SSD, but still, through the little Lexan window, you can see the drive performing a quicksilver ballet of operations to make the experience actually real. If you've ever installed 211 BSD Unix on MSCP disks, you know the ritual. The kernel would love to have a disk label before it can mount anything, and the userland tools that write disk labels need a running system. That's the kind of chicken and egg bootstrapping that can be painful. My workaround was to boot a known good image, one that I prepared in the SimH emulator. Then I could bring the machine up single user and then write the disk label to the RA82 device. The disk label is the actual partition table and it's stored on a special area of the disk. Now, partitioning a new drive under BSD can be a nightmare because the system writes a default but incorrect partition table in memory. And you're not allowed to move or shrink that existing partition, which is a problem. The workaround, which took me days to figure out the first time, basically comes down to creating a second partition that mirrors the first, occupying the exact same blocks, and you call it C or G. Then you access the drive through the second partition and modify the disk label on the first one. Then you can write your final real disk label that has the right geometry. Once I had the partitions created, for the root partition contents, I took the belt and suspenders approach. A straight DD clone of my known good boot partition image block for block, and then a tar pass for the user space to preserve ownership, links, and any tweaks. It's not the fastest thing you'll ever do on a Unibus or a Qbus machine, but it's deterministic. It compared slums at the end and they matched, and with 600 megabytes on the table, you're not going to get very bored. And now for the big moment. On a PDP-11, or at least a 73, with this CPU, you can speak a little console incantation to the built-in ROM. Boot DU0 tells the ROM to boot the first MSCP disk. The RA82's ready was lit, the run was steady, and when I hit it, the kernel load became the world's most satisfying progress bar. 
Activity light twinkling, the turbine note steady, and then the satisfying spew of 211 BSD booting up. CPU type, memory map, and the RA device reporting. Booting Unix from a 200 pound hard drive, there's nothing quite like it. Under load, the RA82 behaves like what it is. A very large, very fast, smart drive from the twilight of the biggest platters. It's quick enough to keep the PDP-1173 happy, and it's honest enough to tell you when something is wrong, and it's theatrical enough that you'll find yourself staring at its panel for no good reason. That fault button is not just decoration. If anything goes sideways, the fault codes are very comprehensive. There's a reason all this all still holds together. DEC did three big things right with the RA82. First, they made the media smart. With per track spares, ECC, air detection, and sector headers that identify the logical block number and everything else, the drive itself can heal weak spots without making the host even participate in it at all. The RCT centralizes the bookkeeping so that you don't have to worry about it. I just don't know what happens if you get two bad sectors on a track. If you know, let me know in the comments. I've been curious. Second, they gave the drive a brain. The dual CPU architecture, a master for comms and overall control, and then a servant for servo and mechanics lets the unit own its behavior. Power up diagnostics, lab tests, fault isolation, all present and accounted for on the drive by the drive without the CPU carry. And third, they isolated you from the physics. MSCP on the PDP-1173 is a civilized interface. You just ask for blocks and the controller and the drive conspire to make it happen. And you never have to think about SKU, detents, RPM, head sectors, tracks, other than when you're doing a disk label, or what the servo is complaining about on that day. If something does fail, you get a precise error classification. Even the human factor stuff is good. The port select buttons don't magically put a port online, they just enable it, and your controller decides when to use it but from a reliability perspective, it's not as ridiculous as these skeptics might assume. With an average seek listed at 24 milliseconds and head switch latency at a maximum of 6 milliseconds, those are not toy numbers. For 1173's workload, they're respectable. And the drive has its own built-in sabbatical. When you tell it to stop, it's stopped in 20 seconds flat. The rest of the time, it just runs. Now, if you're used to modern drives that hide every detail behind the smart interface or SATA interface, when you're working with vintage drives, you have to accept that bad sectors aren't a moral failing. DEC designed the RA82 to repair itself. ECCs, RBNs, and the RCT exist exactly so that you can keep using the drive as it ages without babysitting it all the time. Now, every time I do one of these boot a machine from the thing it would have used back in the 80s episodes, I always get comments that are some combination of neat but impractical. And I get it. But here's why it was worth doing, even if the Unibone could have stayed in place forever. First, it's faithful. The PDP-1173 has enough CPU to keep an RA82 busy, and the RA82 has enough bandwidth to keep the 1173 honest and working. DEC engineered these pieces to be friends. Second, it's educational. You can learn more about storage from one afternoon with an RA82 front panel and user guide than from a dozen white papers. The RA82 spec, 58 sectors per track, half surface for dedicated servo data, 15 heads plus one servo head, 19.2 megabytes per spindle per second, it all tells a story of what the late 80s thought was a good balance between aerial density and recoverability. And third, it's beautiful. The turbine sound says, I'm doing real work here, and the glow of the ready on the RA82 is the most honest progress bar I know. All right, let's go through the whole power-up sequence. We'll start with the desk itself. We're not going to power up the VAX. But we'll power up the big two RL02 drives. So let me hit that one. I have to hit a power bar for that one. And then we'll hit the run lights or load the discs. There we go, as they come online. Terminal is now active, and we can go and hit the main machine on the rack. And we'll give it a minute. Stabilize before we hit the spindle motor. Oh, I tripped the breaker. Here it comes. Spin it up. Oh, I tripped the breaker, but it came back. Should 
get a ready light fairly soon. There we go. And you'll see start of the system. Remember, I'm mostly in this for the subs and likes, so I'd be honored if you consider leaving me one of each before you go today. And if you're already subscribed, thank you. Please make sure you haven't been accidentally unsubscribed at some point. Thanks for joining me out here in the shop today. In the meantime and in between time, hope to see you next time, right here in Dave's Garage. Do it, Lynn. Do it, do it. <laughs>